Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Into the Killing. If this is your first episode, thank you so much for checking us out. If you listen to other episodes, we want to say a big thank you. And of course, if you've listened to the other 53 episodes, we owe you the biggest thanks of all, and we really appreciate that you come back and listen to the new episodes. For this week's episode, we're going back to September 1993. On September 10th, 1993, The X-Files, starring David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson, debuted on Fox. X-Files' initial run was nine seasons long. It spawned two feature-length movies, one that was released in 1998 and a second that was released in 2008. It also spawned comic books and novels. Over a decade after the show ended, it was revived. A tenth season was released in 2016 and the eleventh season aired in 2018. Less than a week after The X-Files debuted, Frasier, a spin-off of the sitcom Cheers, debuted on NBC. Frasier would stay on the air for 11 seasons. For five consecutive years, it won the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Comedy Series. Its star, Kelsey Grammer, won the Emmy four times for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Comedy Series. Frasier has been revived for a new season that will be coming out in 2022. On September 14, 1993, Hurricane Gert formed over the Caribbean Sea. It moved along the Atlantic Ocean, crossed over Mexico and parts of Central America, and dissipated in the Pacific Ocean on September 26. The hurricane killed 116 people, and 16 people were left missing. The storm also caused over $170 million in damage. On September 18th, the number one movie was the critically acclaimed action thriller, The Fugitive. The movie was based on the ABC TV series that ran from 1963 to 1967. The TV series was partially based on the case of Sam Shepard. Shepard was a neurosurgeon. He was wrongly convicted of the 1954 murder of his pregnant wife. The number one song on the Billboard charts was Dream Lover by pop diva Mariah Carey. It could have been a song that 17-year-old Mandy Steingasser heard on the night of September 18th. Mandy lived in North Tonawanda, New York, which had a population of around 33,000 people. It was a middle working class city. The citizens pride themselves on the city's safety, especially compared to Buffalo. North Tonawanda is part of the Buffalo Niagara metropolitan area. Mandy was the only child of Richard and Lorraine Steingasser. She was a good kid, but she wasn't perfect. She didn't get straight A's and didn't always follow the rules. In other words, she was a typical teenager. When she graduated from high school, she planned on attending Niagara County Community College. She didn't know what she wanted to do for work. What Mandy did know was that she loved her parents and her friends. She also loved animals, especially turtles. She adored her family sheepdog, Sam. She was also a proud environmentalist. Like many teenagers, Mandy loved music. Much of the music she loved was released before she was born and when she was a toddler. This included the Beatles, Janis Joplin, and Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. But her favorite band was the English rock gods, Led Zeppelin. Mandy was a senior in high school and she had an eclectic group of friends. She had friends who were considered jocks and others who were considered freaks. When Mandy was 15 years old, she started to party. She discovered she liked it, and by the time she was 17, she was doing it regularly. She drank, and it's believed that she smoked a little bit of marijuana. Her parents knew that she was drinking when she was out with friends, but they didn't think it was a big deal. She wasn't flunking out of school, or driving drunk, or doing hard drugs, and she had never been arrested. They knew she was a good kid, and when they gave her a curfew, she usually made it home in time. We're just going to take a short break from this episode to bring you word from our sponsor, Babbel. I was one of those people who loved their high school days, and one of my least favorite parts was taking French class. I vaguely remember staring at the chalkboard and my teacher trying to explain how to conjugate verbs. Today, if I was dying of thirst, I don't know if I'd be able to ask for a glass of water in French. 
Needless to say, I was a bit hesitant to start using Babbel, but they have sold more than 10 million subscriptions, so I figured it was worth checking out. I was super impressed with Babbel. Their lessons are a lot of fun, and it's the easy way to learn a new language. Babbel gives you language that you'll use in the real world. There are so many good reasons to learn a new language. For example, it can help connect you with family around the world. It can give you an edge when applying for a new job. And of course, it can help while traveling abroad. I chose to learn Dutch because I have family in the Netherlands and I hope to travel to Amsterdam one day. Besides Dutch, there are 13 other languages you can learn, like Spanish, Italian, German, and French. And I'm positive, if you choose to learn French, you'll do way better than I did in high school. Babel's lessons are only about 15 minutes long, so it's easy to fit a lesson into your daily schedule. Other language learning apps use AI to create their lessons, but Babel's lessons were created by over 100 language experts. Babel's also been scientifically proven to be effective. One of the most amazing aspects of Babel is their speech recognition technology, so it helps with your pronunciations and your accent. And Babel has so many ways to learn. They have podcasts, videos, stories, games, and even live classes. You should check out Babbel because there's nothing to lose because it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, save up to 60% with your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash listed. That's babbel.com slash listed for up to 60% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. On the night of Saturday, September 18th, Mandy told her parents that she was going out with friends. Her father told her to be home at midnight. After leaving home, Mandy joined up with her friends, 17-year-old Stacy Belaznik, Wayne Milsarek, and Brian Frank. Milsarek was over 21, and he had his own apartment. The first stop for the group was the liquor store, where they purchased some whiskey and rum. Then they went back to Milsarek's apartment and drank. At around 9 p.m., they got into Mil Sarek's car and drove to a club in Buffalo. They were hoping to see a rock band. But since Mandy and Stacy were underage, they weren't allowed in the club. The group then went to one of Mil Sarek's friend's apartments in Buffalo. They stayed for a bit, then they went back to Mil Sarek's apartment where they continued to drink. That night, Stacy was planning on sleeping over at Mandy's home. The problem was that they had missed the midnight curfew. Had they been in the right mind, they probably would have called Mandy's parents. But they were drinking and having fun. They heard that there was a house party a few houses down, so they decided to head there. Around 1 a.m., the four of them set out on foot for the party. As they walked, a car with several men pulled up. They accused Wayne Milsarek and Brian Frank of harassing a woman in the neighborhood. Milsarek and Frank denied it because they had harassed the woman. But the men were convinced that they did. Two of the men jumped Frank and kicked him after getting him on the ground. Another man grabbed a broken liquor bottle off the ground and cut Milsarek's arm. Mandy and Stacy were freaked out by the attack. Mandy took off and started walking. The police were called and the men in the car took off. Stacy, Milsarek, and Frank regrouped at Milsarek's apartment. It's believed that Mandy started walking home, which is about a mile away. A woman at a payphone saw Mandy walking. Then a man in a car driving in the opposite direction pulled a U-turn, and pulled up beside Mandy. Mandy talked to the man for a few minutes through the passenger window. She then got into the passenger seat, and the car drove off. That was the last time 17-year-old Mandy Steingasser was seen alive. Her parents reported her missing the next day. Two days after she went missing, the man who picked her up walked into the police station. He was 18-year-old Joseph Belstad, and he knew Mandy because they attended the same high school. He said he started to drive Mandy home, but then, a few minutes later, she said she changed her mind. She wanted to go to a house party she had heard about. 
so he turned the car around and dropped her off at a church near the party. He said that Mandy got out of his car and met up with a young man who was of Puerto Rican descent. That was the last time he saw her. We're just going to take another short break to bring you a word from our other awesome sponsor, Acorn TV. I can't remember the last TV show I saw on an American TV network that was really unique or interesting. The dialogue always feels full of catchphrases, and the plot lines are tired and worn out. That's why I'm thankful for Acorn TV. It's the best place to get shows from Britain, Ireland, Australia, and beyond. All the shows feel fresh and new, and new material is added every week. Acorn TV is the largest and best commercial-free British streaming service. They have so many series with compelling stories. They have exclusive premieres and amazing originals you won't find anywhere else. No matter what genre you're looking for, like mystery, drama, comedy, history, Acorn has it. They have hundreds of exclusive shows from around the world, and many of them are award-winning. The series are often bold, wonderfully written, and visually striking. Plus, many of the series feature renowned actors and hosts like David Tennant, and Mary Barry. One of my favorite series on Acorn TV that I think you'll really like as well is The Chelsea Detective. This Acorn TV original follows D.I. Max Arnold, who lives on an old houseboat. His life is in sharp contrast to the crimes he investigates in one of London's most affluent areas, Chelsea. This series is completely riveting, and each episode will keep you guessing until the very end. Not only does Acorn TV have a ton of amazing content, but at $5.99 month, It's just a fraction of the cost compared to other streaming services. Acorn TV is also really easy to use. I either watch it on my Roku or I simply cast from my phone or laptop to my TV. Acorn TV also has a great collection of gritty crime drama like Thorn, Jack Taylor, and The Drowning. They're series that you won't easily forget. For original shows from Britain and beyond, Acorn TV has them all. You're going to love it like I do. Try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and use my promo code listed. But you have to enter the code in all lowercase letters. That's A-C-O-R-N dot TV promo code listed to get your first 30 days for free. Acorn.tv code listed. Elsa told the police they went to Canada with some friends after dropping her off. The police investigated Belstad's story, and they found several problems with it. No one saw him drop Mandy off, and no one knew who the young Puerto Rican man was. The police discovered that Belstad had asked several friends to lie about his whereabouts for the time when Mandy went missing. Belstad's best friend, Gerard Miller, told the police that he, Belstad, and three other young men were hanging out earlier that evening. They were in Belstad's car, and he was driving. He got pulled over by a police officer, and he was given a ticket for two traffic violations. Then they drove over to the city of Tondawana Police Headquarters, where Belstad protested the tickets. Afterward, they sat in his car and tried to figure out what they would do for the rest of the night. Miller suggested going to Canada, but Belstad said he didn't want to. Instead, he just wanted to drive around. So Miller and the other young man went to Canada without him. Miller said that he returned to North Tonawanda that night and he went to the home where Miller lived with his grandmother. But his car wasn't there. Sometime later, Miller said that he drove by Belstad's mother's home and his grandmother's home and he didn't see his car. Miller said they saw Belstad two days later and he told him to tell the police they went to Canada with them. The police found two witnesses who did see Belstad at a coin operated car wash in North Tonawanda at around 2.15 a.m. This was about an hour and 15 minutes after Mandy was seen getting into his car. In late September 1993, Joseph Belstad sat down for a polygraph exam. But he stormed out in the middle because he didn't like the tone of the questions. A short time later, he sat down for another polygraph exam. And he was asked the following two questions. Are you involved in the disappearance of Mandy? Are you withholding any information? He answered no to both questions. It was determined that he was not telling the truth. 
At the time, the police weren't even sure that Mandy was dead, meaning no crime had been committed. Mandy's family hoped that she was alive and had run away. A young man she had liked, Chris Palish, moved to Florida two days before she went missing. Her family was hoping that she was just with him. Sadly, any hope that they had was dashed out on October 25th, 1993, just over a month after Mandy went missing. Two men were looking for mushrooms in a park in Lewiston, New York, close to Bond Lake. Lewiston is a town about 16 miles from North Tonawanda. As they walked on a trail, they smelled something awful. They looked down into a ravine and they saw the source of the scent. It was a decomposing dead body. They immediately called the police. The police arrived on the scene. The body was covered in a denim jacket. The victim's pants had been partially pulled down. Her bra was wrapped around her neck. However, she had not been raped. It was determined to be the body of 17-year-old Mandy Steingasser. The medical examiner determined that she had been struck on the head. The blow fractured her skull. Her bra had been ripped off and she had been strangled to death with it. Based on the evidence, the police surmised what happened. The area where the body was found was used as a lover's lane. The killer tried to put sexual advances on Mandy and started to pull her pants down. But she stopped him. He became angry, so he hit her in the head. He then ripped her bra off and strangled her to death. He pushed her down the embankment, hoping that her body would roll into the lake, but some bushes stopped it. Not only did the police have a theory about what happened, but they also had a prime suspect, 18-year-old Joseph Belstadt. The only problem was that they didn't have any evidence that he had killed her. What they did know was that Belstadt was the last person seen with Mandy, and he had lied to the police about where he was at the time of the murder. But none of this proved definitively that he was the killer. The police seized Belstadt's car, and it was examined for evidence. In the back seat, they found a pubic hair. Testing was done, and it did not appear to have come from Mandy or Belstadt. After the body was found, the police questioned Belstad again. He admitted that he had lied about going to Canada. Belstad said he thought he needed an alibi or he would have looked guilty. He said he had just gone to a donut shop after he dropped Mandy off at the church. Belstad claimed he knew nothing about Mandy's murder. He said he had never been to the area where her body was found. But once again, the police learned that Belstad had lied. The police talked to one of Belstad's friends and learned that he had taken a young woman to that area because it was Lover's Lane. Eventually, they found the young woman who went to the area with him. A week or two before Mandy was murdered, they had parked a few dozen feet away from where her body was eventually found. But Belstad's lies were not enough to prove that he had committed the murder. It wasn't long before the case went cold. In August 2000, nearly seven years after the murder, the Buffalo News published a story about the murder. In it, they don't name Joseph Belstad as the suspect because he had not been identified as a suspect by the police. While no arrests had been made, a lot had happened in the nearly seven years since the murder. Five detectives worked on the case, and they all thought that Belstad was the killer. One investigator said that the whole city knew who killed Mandy. The police were accused of covering up for Belstad, or not doing their jobs properly. They said they wanted Belstad to be arrested. The district attorney, on the other hand, felt that there was enough evidence to charge him. 
It turned out that a hair had been found on Mandy's body. Testing showed it could have belonged to Belstad, but was not definitive. Joseph Belstad was interviewed for the story. He was adamant that he didn't kill Mandy. He claimed he dropped her off near the church and she went off with her friend. In the years since Mandy's murder, he did time in jail for auto theft. He says that Mandy's friends and family have harassed him in the years since the murder. He ended up dropping out of school because of the accusations. He said that shortly after the murder, someone fired a gun outside of his home. He thinks that person was trying to intimidate him. Then, in 1999, he was drinking at a bar and one of Mandy's friends came up to him. He called him a murderer and they got into a fist fight. Belstead said that the police investigation was biased and he wanted the police to leave him alone. But he was sure that the police were going to make out false evidence to arrest him. It turned out that Belstead's family had even taunted the police. In 1997, the lead investigator on the case was working part-time as security at a music venue. One night, a country band was playing at the venue. The detective looked out into the crowd and made eye contact with Belstad's brother. A few minutes later, Belstad's brother started calling out a song request. The detective knew he was saying it to antagonize him because it wasn't a country song. It was Mandy by pop singer Barry Manilow. Mandy's murder was incredibly tough on her parents. They left her room just the way it was on the night she left for the last time. Her clothes still hung in the closet and Led Zeppelin posters were still up on the wall. Her father said, I try not to think about it. I know we're never going to get her back. You got to get on with your life. I try to keep it out of my mind, but there are 20 things that happen every day to remind me of her. The memories keep coming back. More years went by, and more testing was done on the pubic hair that was found in the back seat. But again, no match was found. In 2017, 24 years after the murder, the case was reopened. In 1993, when the murder was committed, Bill Clinton was president. In 2017, Donald Trump was sworn in as Commander-in-Chief. As we mentioned in the intro, 1993 saw the debuts of The X-Files and Frasier. Just some of 2017's major debuts were the utterly bleak but brilliant Handmaid's Tale, the soapy teen drama Riverdale, based on the Archie comics, and Netflix's outstanding crime drama Ozark. 1993's biggest song, was I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston for the Bodyguard soundtrack. In 2017, it was The Shape of You by Ed Sheeran, who was just two years old when Mandy was murdered. In 1993, the top movie at the box office was Steven Spielberg's brilliant Jurassic Park, while Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven took home the Academy Award for Best Picture. In 2017, the highest grossing movie was Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. 2017's Academy Awards ceremony was quite memorable. Presenters for the best picture, Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway, were given the wrong envelope. As a result, they announced that the musical La La Land was the best picture, when really, the drama Moonlight had won. In those 24 years, forensic tools had improved vastly, and finally, some progress was made on the case. Amongst the material vacuumed up for the back seat of Belsat's car, another pubic hair was found. In early 2018, DNA testing was performed on both hairs. On March 10th, 2018, the police got the results of the DNA testing. They were Mandy's hairs. An expert noted that there was still root tissue on the hairs. He said that root tissue suggests that they came out with force. So on April 24, 2018, nearly 25 years after the murder, Joseph Belstad was arrested. After he was arrested, the police continued to look for evidence against him. 
One thing they learned was that the male DNA in Mandy's underwear did not belong to Belstad. The police wanted to get a DNA sample from Chris Pallish, who Mandy had a relationship with before she died. He had moved to Florida two days before she disappeared. In the decades since the murder, Pallish had been arrested three times for domestic violence. When the police in North Tonawanda asked for his DNA, he refused to give a sample. In 2019, the police rifled through his parents' garbage and collected some used disposable utensils. After learning the police had done that, Palish gave a sample of his DNA. They compared his DNA to the DNA evidence from the crime scene. It turned out that it was Palish's DNA on Mandy's underwear. Palish talked to the police and he said that he did have sex with Mandy. He couldn't remember how many times they had sex or when they did it. But he said they probably had sex a week before she was killed. Usually, if a man's DNA is found in a murder victim's underwear, he would be the prime suspect. That wasn't so in this case. That was because Mandy wasn't raped. It turns out that bodily fluid can remain in clothing for a long time, even if the clothing has been washed. Palish also had an alibi for the night of the murder. He was over 1,300 miles away in Florida. The prime suspect remained Joseph Belstadt. Joseph Belstadt's trial started on October 25, 2021, which was the 28th anniversary of the day her body was found. The prosecution didn't have a magic bullet piece of evidence. Instead, they argued that all the circumstantial evidence pointed to Belstad. No one, including Belstad himself, disputed that he picked up Mandy on the night she was murdered. He claimed he dropped her off at a church and she met up with a friend. But no one saw him do this and the police never found any proof that the friend ever existed. Belstad then lied about where he went after he supposedly dropped off Mandy. He also asked his friends to lie for him. The next time Belstad was seen after picking up Mandy was at a coin-operated car wash. That would have been about an hour and 15 minutes after Mandy was seen getting into his car. Why was he cleaning his car at that time? The police believe that Mandy was killed by someone who tried to put sexual advances on her, but she stopped him. Belstad claimed that nothing physical happened with Mandy. She simply got into the passenger seat and then got out a short time later. If that was true, then how did her pubic hair end up in the back seat of his car? Also, Belstad claimed he had never been in the area where Mandy's body was found. The police tracked down a woman who said a week or two before Mandy went missing, she went with Belstad to that area. They parked just a few dozen feet from where her body was found. The defense argued that none of the evidence proved that Belstad killed Mandy. The pubic hairs were the most damning evidence. The defense argued that they could have been on the outside of her pants. They said that the hairs, just like all the other evidence, just proved that Mandy was in his car, which is what Belstad has maintained the entire time. None of it proved that he killed her. The defense called Belstad a little scrawny, pimply-faced kid who wasn't aggressive. Sometime after Mandy went missing, Mandy's cousin and her friend confronted Belstad at school. One of them grabbed Belstad by the front of his shirt and pushed him against the wall outside the cafeteria. Belstad didn't fight back. Instead, he cowered. So according to the defense, Belstat was an unlikely person to rip off a woman's bra and strangle her to death with it. The defense also suggested a different suspect, that was Chris Palish. They argued he had a history of violence that included three arrests for domestic violence. Also, his DNA was found on Mandy's underwear. 
The prosecution argued that may have exonerated Belstad had it been a rape case, but Mandy had not been raped. The trial lasted three weeks, during which 65 witnesses testified. The jury of six men and six women deliberated for 10 hours over two days. They found Joseph Belstad guilty of second-degree murder. In January 2022, he was sentenced to 25 years to life. He maintains he is innocent. 47-year-old Joseph Belstad is serving his sentence at the Five Points Correctional Facility in Romulus, New York. He'll be eligible for parole in November 2046 when he'll be 71 years old. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Don't forget to check out our spooky YouTube channel, Paranormally Listed. You can find it at youtube.com slash paranormally listed. Of course, we still have our original true crime channel, Criminally Listed. We have nearly 350 videos featuring bizarre but true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash criminally listed. Well, that's all for today. Thanks for listening. Please stay safe and take care of yourself.